Get Better Basketball Live is up next. Today, I'm excited to speak to Coach Demetrius Weir, who's a former college basketball coach at the University of Michigan, Dearborn, also a former high school basketball coach, current consultant for coaches, and also a fast model contributor. Coach Ware is going to talk about winning plays for end of game situations, and you're not going to want to miss this up now. Hi, everyone. Coach DeMarco here with Get Better Basketball Live, and today my guest is Demetrius Ware. Um, Coach, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine. Thank you very much. Well, I'm really excited to have you on today because I feel like the topic we're going to discuss, these end of game situations and kind of winning plays, so to speak. Um, and I had a chance to look at these plays and I'm excited to go through them. But before we do, um, you, you have such a range of experience at the high school level, the college level, consulting, uh, contributing for Fast Model, so many different things. So can you just give us a little bit of background uh, as to where you started as a coach and, you know, what you're doing today? Um, you know, I know you're working really hard to support coaches today, too. So maybe just a little background. Well, uh, be honest with you, I started coaching Little League Baseball first. And I coached Little League Baseball for about uh, 10 years, starting when I was 18 years old. Uh, and I went from Little League Baseball to uh, middle school, no, I went to high school baseball. And I was an assistant varsity coach and a junior varsity head coach. I did that for a year and a half. And I got blessed that I met a coach uh, at a college called Oakland Community College in Farm Daniels. And his coach's name was uh, Coach Lynn Reed. Uh, coach Reed is the father of, um, of Brent Reed, who Dr. Brent Reed, who was the head coach at Lehigh University now. And so um, Coach let me come in, and his son at the time was an assistant coach. And I just started watching. I think the second day I came in, he put me to work. <laughs> and so from that point, he put me to work, and it was, it was, you know, he wasn't paying me or anything. And at the end of the season, he retired. And he, he, he was so sweet and, you know, recognized how much work I did that he uh, actually paid me out of his own pocket at the end of the season. So that was my first gig. But when he retired, we had the fourth coach on the bench become the head coach because he was the only one at the time um, who had a, a, a bachelor's degree. And uh, the assistant coaches, uh, Brendan, then went to go finish his, his PhD. So anyway, he asked me to come on, and I happened to be the associate head coach. This, um, this, uh, the coach that got the position, he accepted me on and asked me to take on the gig with him, and I did. And next thing I know, at the end of the season, we had a bad season. It was 25, 20, we were 5 and 25. But I had recruited most of the guys because he didn't have any coaching or recruiting experience. Um, so at the end of the year, he decided to quit with five games left. I was on the road doing recruiting and scouting. So when I come back and find out that he's recruiting, you know, I applied for the job. Let's say I got the job. So I was able to be a, a young head coach at an early age at about 33, 35 years old. And I had kids in the family, had been married for about, about, about six or seven years now. And so I was a head coach at Oakland Community College. We went to the playoffs. Uh, we knocked off uh, the national. We walked, we, we beat about three uh, national ranked teams during the course we were there. One year we beat um, the same team. We were top five in the country twice in a week because we played them back to back and we beat them by 30 each game. It's one, one of my favorite stories to talk about. But um, so I was blessed to do that. And uh, after I did that, I went back and got my master's. And um, uh, from there, I got an assistant coach job with a, not a prominent high school coach here in Detroit. And we won uh, three uh, state championships back to back. I was on the last two. And um, so I did that. And I was truly blessed to do that. Then I got the job as a uh, director of basketball operation at the University of Michigan in Dearborn. Um, and uh, did that for two years. I really enjoyed it. Matter of fact, short story, the assistant coach, let's talk about relationships. Uh, I hired an assistant coach my last year at OCC. Um, to be come along and work with me. And he worked with me until about three weeks into the season. And then he went to take a teaching job. Well, this same coach hired me as a director of basketball operations when he got the job at Oakland at uh, University of Michigan in Dearborn, so you how relationships work. And so I worked with him for two years. And during the course of working with him, we got a new athletic director, a temporary uh, athletic director. And she's seen my work ethic and she's seen some of the things that, you know, 
our doing to uh, help the program and any university as a whole, she asked me to take on the woman's job. So I took on the woman's position, knowing that it was probably only gonna be a three year position. And um, I took that on and I was there in that position for three years and we had some success and we had an uh, academic, we had about three or four academic All-Americans. I had uh, one honorable mention All-American um, from the court and all-conference player. So I've been blessed to be around a lot of places. I've even got a chance to do a year in the CBA. So that was the old G League before, for folks who don't know what the CBA is. That's what the G League used to be called, the CBA. So I've been blessed. I've been honored to do it. And uh, I just love coaching. It's part of when I give back to the community and helping young people develop. Coach, I have to ask, you know, you have such a range of experience and a very impressive resume with some, uh, it sounds like some really big wins at different levels. What was your favorite? You know, what was your favorite? I know we love coaching. We love all our jobs, but what was your favorite job that you had? Because, you, you know, you kind of coached at a, a range of different levels. I enjoyed the CBA because it, it, was, it was a professional one. I only did it for a year. I had a great coach there who, was, who played at LSU when Pete was there, and uh, so he was an awesome coach. It was fun to learn from him, and he went on to coach in Germany, I mean, not Germany, uh, Russia, for four years. But my, I'd say my favorite moment is my first year at uh, OCC at the head coach. Um, Schoolcraft, which is a community college here as well, they were ranked in the top five in the country. Um, and this previous year, like I said, the previous year, we were, we were five and 25. And so the pre when we went in to play them, my first year there, everybody had us underdogs. And um, I actually, I ran a one-two-two two zone. That was a matchup zone we ran. We got it out of, I got it out of Lou Hoss out of Arizona. And now teams hadn't seen it yet. So we run this one-two-two two zone against Schoolcraft. I mean, I mean, they had some talent. Um, and we beat them by 30 points. <laughs> you know, we literally beat them by 30 points. And my point guard at the time, Montez Briggs, he lit them up for like 28 points in the first game. Then I had a couple other guys in, in 30 um, who had a couple of double-figure games too. So that was my actually my the moment I was really, really proud of myself and my, my players. A week later, we had to play them at our place. And um, by the time the first half was over with, the head coach had already been ejected. We were up by 30 again. And we wanted to beat them by about 35 the next time we played them. So we beat the top five team in the country twice in a week. So that's always been my favorite one. You know, I, I, and the, the guy, to the, like I told the reporter, the reporter asked me, well, coach, how did you do that? I said, I didn't do anything. I let the, that's the, the player did all the playing. I just coached, but in, in, the, in the back of my head, I was screaming from ear to ear. Yeah, that's, that's an impressive uh, feat. You know, beating a team, you know, twice in a season is difficult, but to beat them twice in the same week, uh, you know, such a good caliber team, that's certainly not not an easy thing. So, Coach, today you're going to share with us some uh, winning plays for late game situations. Can you talk a little bit about um, the type of late game situations? There's a lot of different things. What are you going to focus on um, today for us in terms of late game situations? Well, I'm going to focus on um, three uh, plays that we've used in the past and then a couple of half-court classes that were, uh, half court, uh, set that we used as well. Most of the time with these situations, we're looking at a dead ball situation where a batch has been made or, um, and you've perceived the ball back. So the first three would be full court sets and then the other two would be half court sets. Um, so what we've done is I've kind of uh, put everything in a frame set of 10 seconds uh, down to five seconds. So within those 10 seconds is an eternity as far as last minute shots. Uh, so a lot of these are five seconds, pretty much. You know, even with six, you know, with six seconds, you definitely can pull these off. Uh, I think a, a couple of other things that I've done is um, I've looked at some things that some coaches have done and uh, applied that to how we put some of these together. Um, to be honest with you, the one that I'm going to show you first, and then a couple of them uh, follow off of that one. I got it from Coach K. I don't know if you remember. It must have been about 15 years ago. K was down. Uh, uh, at, a, at, a, at what about six or seven seconds left, and he ran a full court play from the bay out of bounds, and the whole point of it was to have that guard go straight down the middle. Well, the defender got to decide: am I going to guard him or play off of him? And I, I, from that, and what he did with that, I believe the defender played off of him, and as he played off of him, he was able to attack the basket, and he got the layup, 
and they won. But what it does is, so when you go down that middle, you got to force that defender to make a decision what he's going to do with you. Especially, you know, and so uh, if you if you need that, if you if that gives you the opportunity to make that defender have to do something, then everyone else has to read and react to how you set it up from there. So Coach K gave me the um, the, uh, the thought process of making sure everything you're running with that short amount of time try to go down the middle of the court and keep you uh, allow the guards and the outsides to get to be open and free. Well, I'm, I'm excited to see these plays, Coach, and I, I, I do believe I remember the play and the scenario you're talking about. So why don't we jump into this first play and, uh, and you know, go through it, and uh, I might have a few questions for you as we do. Well, this first play we're going to work on, uh, we call it 9-11. Um, and so it's pretty it lets you know we're pretty much what, situ what our situation is. And, again, our goal in doing this is getting our guards – open as possible, so as quickly as possible, and um, making an option for them to get the ball down the court. So um, we usually, we want to make sure our best player who can pass the ball, sometimes, and especially our best big, um, especially if he's not a shooter, we want to find a role for him and have them um, make sure that they can um, contribute. So one of the things we look for and we, we emphasize is to make sure our base can pass, get, uh, make good passes, Baseball pass, whatever necessary. Uh, in this case, so what we want, we want um, this ball. We want to put the uh, guard at the top of the key here. We want to give him an op an opportunity to go either direction, left or right, whatever way he wants. And sometimes in other plays, we'll actually set a, a, a big another big here, a four or a three, and let him run a screen off of him. So depending on the defense and what they're going to do, but in this case. We're going to say that this guard is going to get free. And once he gets free, five is their main job is to hit one coming off of there. Now, once he hits one, uh, we're going to have three here at this corner, and this is our, our outlet. So once that pass goes in, three automatically goes at an angle down the timeline but starts uh, angling towards the, um, the, uh, the front court. And we have our four here who's uh, right here waiting. And again, we've spread it out the court, so we got our four. This is usually can be replaced with a four or three, either one that can shoot the best, because this is our second best shooter uh, going to this corner here. And when this play goes in, and once the ball goes in quickly, one has one job actually to get down the middle of that uh, lane. Um, and as soon as he's driving down that lane, three's cut in there, and he's looking for a quick pass right to three. Now, that's the first option. And what three is going to do is three is going to just take one step, hit two, and two is going to take that jump shot. If we need that three, is that three or two has the option to hit that four. That whole situation can take less than five seconds to complete. What I love, well, what I love about this play, coach, is the option. And when I right there where you are, I love when you know one can hit three up the floor, who's making a hard cut to the middle. It's going to put the defense under pressure. But where two is and four going up the sideline, there's that opportunity to go from two and then a quick pass to four for yes. an open shot. Um, it almost reminds me of the Valparaiso play, a little bit different because mm -hmm. that was just a full length of the court pass and then a dump off to Bryce Drew who hit the three-pointer. Yes. But it has an element of that because if you hit the two, that four coming up the sideline, if they outrun their man, they could potentially be open. Uh, but the other part of this is it puts defenses in a bind because you have a lot of players at half court or on the other end of the floor and really only that two player up the court. So there's not going to be a lot of help there. Exactly. They got to make it team defend it. So I, I really like that play. Um, when you, when this type of play pans out, what's the option that you typically see um, use the most? Like what, what, it, what, what most frequently has happened? Well, there's two things that go with this play that I, I failed to mention, and that is that that, that point guard, he's going to have a high basketball IQ. All right, and I, so that's really important to emphasize. And when we came up with this play, well, the point guard that we had had a very high IQ. And the play where you will, the thing with this is the guard has options. So if that, if, like I said, if it's under 10 seconds or even up to about six seconds, once that guard gets that ball and he starts breaking hard, 
He's got the three coming down off the lane that he can hit, but also he can hit that four, and that four can catch that ball and kick the two or drive. But the most important thing is if you have a really smart point guard in this situation, that guard goes, let's just say you need the two and you the two to tie, three to win. That guard, or you need the two to win. That guard, if he's smart enough, he knows he can attack that basket. The defender's got to stay out because you don't want to foul. And, you know, you got a good guard up there. He can attack that basket and go straight. And that two can actually be used as a, as a screen or a back screen on him as well while he attacked that basket. But so, we, many, so many options. And I think that's really, you know, in this situation, depending on what the defense does and your personnel, like you said, a great point guard might take that and, and, and go with it. There's a lot of different options. So this is a great play, 911. Uh, at, you know, yeah. good name for an end of the game play because you're trying to, you know, it's, it's that emergency situation. There's always that fire sprinting down and take that missed shot. And we get that fire should be at that board just in case you can get that rebound for a putback. So that five job not done once he gets that ball in. He's got to sprint his butt all the way down there and make sure he's there in case there's a missed shot there. He can get that board. And if he does do a great job of that, he's got a chance, you know, in a 10-second scenario to get a put back, um, yeah. you know, in that type of situation. Five seconds, you know, maybe not. But if he hustles, he's got a good opportunity, depending on time, to get an option, uh, you know, a good scoring opportunity. So uh, next play here, it looks like uh, Sydney. Um, and why don't you take us through this one, Coach? Well, one of the things that I had, and I do a tradition of doing this, I always try to name a play after a former player. A uh, player who I know, whatever it may be, it may be his, his work ethic or he was funny or something. I always try to, and I always make sure it's after they're gone so I don't want people to get mad at me. Well, he named the play after somebody during the season. So this play is for one of the point guards that I had. And his name was uh, Sydney. So we named this play Sydney too. And again, it goes back to spreading that defense out. And, and uh, especially when you just, the five can run, run the base like, like I said. A lot of these are off of timeouts or off of a main basket. So he can run that baseline. And again, what we want to do is on um, Sydney here, we're going to have, we're going to move that uh, point guard all the way to the uh, other side of the weak side of the court. We're going to put our four at the center here and we're going to allow this four to do a back screen and he can either come over it or around it to get open. Once he gets open, the four, he's going to come to the ball, five hits him again. Now, Five becomes a trailer instead of, in this situation, the five becomes a trailer. The four is going to sprint about all the way down to uh, the half court line. And with this, what this one job is to do, once they catch it, it's really simple. He's just driving straight down, straight down the middle. And then what he has, he's got two options there again. He actually has three. He's going to hit this three right here, or he's going to hit this two in the corner. So let's just say we need a three to get this done. Again, my principle of doing this is that whoever defending him, they don't want to foul him. So they're going to have to give him some space and some leverage. And so what you're doing is, is this one driving up here, he's looking at this situation, and he's driving, and he knows, he knows which one's his best shooter. And he, he got an opportunity to hit one or two. And if they're defending it, he, he can take the drive, and he can pull up himself and shoot it. So it's another quick shot play. You know, there's no rocket science to it. Um, like I said, if you have a, a smart point guard, it makes your life a whole lot easier. And uh, it, it actually clears up some space. And again, we got our four trailing. And if your four is a shooter, you can kick it back out to it. And this is something we did a lot. I've done a lot more as I've gotten older, is we've begun to do a lot of transition where we kick it back to the trailer. So this is an option where we can use, where we will kick it back to the trailer uh, at the same time. Or we, use a, we may use the four who's a dummy up here, and then we use the three at the four position, and we know that three can shoot. So we'll give it to him and then kick it back to him if possible. It's just another option. That kickback uh, option reminds me of the uh, Villanova National Championship. I know slightly different, but, uh, you know, they, they beat North Carolina and they kind of just dumped it, you know, left it back and, you know, of course, that three-pointer and they win the national title. But I love, what I, I love that you're doing here, Coach, is you, you, it's simple, it's, it's spacing, it's putting the ball in your athletes or maybe your best player's hands or playmaker's hands. Mm -hmm. You're spacing the floor out and you're giving them options. And I think, you know, in these situations, that puts a lot of stress on the defense because you got your point guard flying down the floor, you got players spread to the wings. Are they going to collapse into the middle 
or are they going to go out and cover those shooters? And depending on what they do, um, you've created a number of options, including that trail option that you mentioned as well. So this is another another great set. Yeah, our next play that we're going to work on, Coach, is called uh, Matez. Uh, this is, again, one of my uh, favorite players, and we named him. Uh, we named this play after him. This play, again, is one that's with about five seconds left, give or take. And, again, we'll have our best big throw this in. And where we start this off is actually like uh, – um, a triple threat of wide receivers, and when they have when you spread those, where you spread them out, they call them triplets. So we do the same thing here. So we'll run um, the two, the one, and our four. Four is more of a decoy, but you know if you can shoot that, that also it always uh, helps. And then we put an athletic player or uh, our three back here. <coughs> Excuse me, coach. And we'll put our three up here somewhere in this area where it doesn't, you know. He's not stuck in this one position, but in this area, he has a frame to go wherever he can go and get free. And what we're looking for is for this pass, all three of these guards are going to, all three of these players are going to go at the same time. They're going to break, but they're kind of staggered too. So this one, he may be closer to the line. This one may be closer to the uh, timeline, a little bit on the other side of the timeline. And he, this one right here is going to be maybe a little bit further down in the, in the uh, front court as well. And what they've got to do, they got to butt their butt on the, on the go. Um, and as soon as they butt their butt, five's got to hit one of those, uh, either one of these who are open. So in this case, we're going to say uh, he gets it to the one again. And what the one's going to do, he's going to break hard to that left to come back. The four's going to the right, and the two's going to turn and go to this right. If they're running here, uh, their job is you're acting now from this point is to just get down there in case the shot goes up and there's a miss. We have the three here who is uh, open and can move around. And however it seems fit, let's just say he hits this three here. He turns and he sees that there's no way he can still make this shot. He had the option of hitting this four coming up or the option of hitting this uh, two coming up. But we want this three to hit this shot right here because we're looking at probably you need a two to win or two to tie. This would be the shot we want them to take, turn around, square up, and just take a real nice shot and go off. And like again, we always have everybody running back to um, uh, get a board. But this was pretty much if you need a two going full court or let you know. And uh, it's been very helpful for us. The biggest problem is most times they'll front this, they'll front and they'll deny it. And then that's when we, we that's why we have the other shooters a much where they have the option to drive it or shoot it from that point if they're fronting or defending that three. And actually, it kind of helps because they got to have to make a decision what they want to do with this, this defensive player. They got to make a decision. Am I going to continue to guard this three? And if he guards them, or he decides to pick up the guard or whoever's this one open, he's he's free to break, and uh, it, it gives him an opportunity to be to be available for an open pass as well. You talked a little bit about hitting the trail uh, player in the last play, and I see that opportunity. I know you talked, you kind of mentioned it briefly here too, but if you do hit that three down the other end of the floor, like a full court pass, mm -hmm. you got the one, you got the four coming down and the two, and, you know, that three could actually catch and just shovel to one yep. of those players if you need a three-pointer. They could fake it and then turn and attack. I mean, there's a lot of options, and then, Obviously, you can hit any one of those players uh, first. So, again, spacing, simple play, a lot of different opportunities. And, you know, defenses have to make, you know, adjustments. And this has a little bit of the Christian Leitner play in. This young man may come up here, young lady may come up here and just back screen this guy. And then gives him that, that, that coming off that screen, you know. And we have a couple of plays we do that too. But this is, that's another option. Uh, the most important part about this play, Coach, is everyone's got to stay in their lanes. Four can't run straight down and, and go to the paint. He's got to stay in that lane and run all the way to two's got to stay in their lane as well. And once they get, like you said, there's where the kickback comes in again. You got the five who's trailing behind there, and he's always there if, if something needs to happen or you need to get rid of that ball. Well, if you know, if you get five seconds and you get it across the line and you got about two seconds left, that can put you into a half court set at, uh, that you can run run a set off of that. So, you know, that advances you to the half court and you probably got about three seconds left 
and you can still get a good shot off your next half court play. That's a great point about, you know, advancing to the half court and, and maybe calling a timeout or whatever and, you know, having that half court set that you want to run. And, you know, as you mentioned, that three has a lot of flexibility there and in, in, in what they can do um, in terms of catching the ball. But um, what I'm hearing is a common theme from you in these late game situations. You talked about everyone kind of staying in their lanes here is really the spacing. And I'm seeing that as you diagram these plays out, it seems like spacing comes first, and then you're looking at, you know, what are the things I can do off of, you know, different actions I can use. But exactly. spacing is really important for you in these situations, Coach? Yeah, it's really important to me. And, and you know, I'm kind of old school, you know, uh, uh, old school, Eddie Fogler and them, they all, everything they did was about spacing. Um, you know, from their, their press breaker, uh, we run a lot of uh, – down the middle trailers on our press breaker. We want that defense spread out, you know, when, when you get in these situations. And, uh, you know, if you have the right personnel, you can get a shot off with, with five seconds left easily and still maybe have a, a 0.1 second, 0.2 seconds left on there uh, to get done. But the spacing has to make the defenders make some decisions, you know. And in this case, like I said, uh, they may try to front that or, or deny that, but there's some, if someone does their job and uh, there's an open space, so you, what teams have to learn is know when to dribble and then know when to push it up. And so you get that dribble, like we said, we have that guard. If he's dribbling, he's got that option. He said, now, nah, all right, I got to get rid of it. And now he's kicking it out. So um, the spacing allows you, when they, do, when they do make an adjustment on defense, you can also have an adjustment because that gives you the spacing in the lanes to make the proper passes. So this is another great example of a play in the full court with minimal time. You want to jump into the half court situations, um, late game situations. Yeah, this is pinch we use. And this is a play that we actually use on half court out of bounds. And we just flip it into a sideline out of bounds play. Again, with about five seconds left on the clock. It's a catch and shoot situation. And what we're looking at here is we'll stack it up one, on the air, on the line, the free throw line extended, the two in the middle, which is our shooter. We got our five, which is our blocker as well. And then we got our um, our chaser, we call them, where he, they've got to chase them or they're going to have to trail them. Uh, but this is another one of our options out of our, out of our shot. And this is definitely the clear space as well. So what we'll do is, once the slaps, the three breaks hard to the uh, weak side corner there, as you can see, uh, the two is going to come towards the, toward the ball. The five and the one are going to pinch hard, create, take away that spacing coming in. One's going to catch, square up, and shoot. Four's following the trailer on the shot. And then everybody else, again, is looking for the rebound on the miss. And we have our three here in the corner. If by any case, this ball, this two guard does get available and have some more space, he can at least try to throw a good path to the three if he has to, if he doesn't have anything open or either the ones rolling off the screen. But our main goal is to get this two, to get this shot off uh, with a good catch, square up and shoot. I like this too, Coach, because, you know, if they, if they play that two to not, you know, the defender plays on the top of them to not let him go that way, he has an opportunity to even cut back towards the basket or out to the opposite corner. Mm -hmm. So. You know, it's tough on defenses here. If they pinch, he pops to the top and gets a three. If a defender cheats over the top, which typically they're probably not going to do because they want to protect the basket, but if they try to deny hard, he can back cut off of this and go the other way uh, off the defender. So there's, there's a lot of options, I feel like, for this, um, for this type of set. And then, of course, the three clearing through is going to create some natural space uh, right. for that two to get open as well. So. This is a good one, and if you have minimal time, even under five seconds, you know, mm -hmm. a quick two two seconds, one second, you, you look like you're going to get a pretty good scoring opportunity here. And, and if they if they do uh, try to deny this, uh, once those guys release off the pinch, you're going to have one of them going to the basket. So you're going to have an open man um, that you can either lob that to coming out of there, or the, the four can lob it to if he's open, or – Again, uh, like I said, the main goal is to get it to two. But if they slip that because they tried to de uh, deny it or, pin off or deny that, you're, he's going to have an open man going to that basket either way, too. It's awesome. That's a great one. 
Yeah, our last play, and this one's on half court again, Coach. Um, I want to explain to you why you say to set up the way this is set up, um, because this play is going to go to uh, our four. And I know a lot of people are probably going to ask you, why is it going to the four? We had a four, um, and she was a remarkable player. When I got her, uh, she was, a, she was our, our power forward, or we could even put her at the three. Um, she could shoot from almost any spot on the floor. She wound up being um, all, Amer uh, honor all, America, uh, all American with honorable uh, mention. Uh, so she improved from averaging, in two years, she went from averaging nine points a game uh, to averaging 17 points a game. Uh, by the time she left in the two years that I had her, she was a thousand point scorer. Uh, so she, she was really prolific and we could do a bunch of things with her. So that's why I have the four on this spot here. Uh, we, so the first thing we set this up is, as you can see, we'll put our four here. Uh, we have our three and then we got our one and our two. So it's a, it's a different kind of lineup than what most people would see, but this is, it works for us and that's why we used it, but you could always change it to adjust to whatever your team's um, ability and skill or skill set is. So we'll have the five throw this in. So everything we did started off with a hand clap or ball clap. And so once that clap goes, one's gonna sprint hard, curl off of this, uh, two's gonna curl off this one real quick, go to the corner again, take away the spacing, force somebody to defend them and go with them. So once that happens, then we're gonna, the, the uh, four and the three are gonna set the double stagger for this one. So this one's gonna take a jab step in or V step in, and then he's gonna come off the double st stagger hard. And so everyone's looking for us to hit this one coming off the stagger to the top of the key, or the five's gonna throw it over the top to the two. Well, uh, coming off that off that stagger, three's gonna just turn around and make a simple uh, back spring for four. Four's coming off, going to the corner. Uh, wherever her shot is, in this case, uh, this four here can shoot from the corner, uh, inside the short corner, wherever. So we knew we could get this ball to her uh, legitimately, and she would have a legitimate open shot for that. So that five hits that four coming off of there, and that's a good shot for her to take, uh, like I said, with five seconds left or three seconds left. And then again, we still have the option of the one up top, and if we, if we can, we can always throw it back door to the two back there. Real simple play, uh, doesn't require a lot of thinking, you know, just execution. Yeah, and I, I love the, you know, the multiple screen, the screener actions. You know, you have uh, that initial one screening for two coming through and then them coming off a staggered. So there's some screen, the screener action. And then you have the four coming off three screen as, mm -hmm. uh, being a screener. So you have multiple screen, the screener actions in just a short amount of time. That's a very, very challenging play uh, to defend. Mm -hmm. uh, and it looks like you're going to get a good shot for, for your player there. Um, good, good open shot for the four coming off that uh, screen, the screener action. So just a ton of options um, on, on this one play. With conference play, you see each other two or three times or everyone's sharing film now. So when they see that, when they think this is coming, instead of uh, having four, instead of four uh, coming off, three turning around and uh, back picking for four, you can have four slip that. To the basket and fives right there to pop it to her right there as well and then if that happens you still got three after this screen here who's got some space in there available too so it's multiple options but you know we will change this up later in the season some tell the teams have seen it or not but we had to run it and then we, we may slip the four or the three off the screen and they have to decide you know if they front this and then we know four is coming off automatically to go uh, catch it in the corner what I, what I love about that set, or really all the sets today, Coach, is that there's just so many options off of them. And I have to say this, and, you know, I'm, I'm glad I had a chance to sit down and talk to you. You do a great job on social media and fast model contributing. Um, but you have a great basketball mind because you took us through these plays. And then, like, in the snap of a finger, you're like, oh, this player can slip, and this is the adjustment. So you not only took us through the plays, yeah, you do that the adjustments. And, different options and even how teams might defend it. So I really appreciate, you know, you sharing your perspective. And um, it's pretty evident that you have a really good mind for basketball. And, 
you know, really these types of situations. Um, so thank you for, for taking the time to share with us today. I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, I enjoy you what you do on social media and the things you do on Wednesdays. And even if I miss them, I'd like to come back in and, and throw my two cents in after. So I appreciate that, Coach. And anytime you can join the Get Better Basketball chat or if you can join me on uh, another episode of Get Better Basketball Live, I'd love to have you. Whatever you need, uh, you know. I appreciate that, Coach. And uh, I'll, be, I'll be looking you up again down the road. And uh, I hope we can do this again. So thank you for your time today. Thanks for all that you shared. Um, you know, these are great sets for coaches to really consider as they head into next year, especially in these special situations. So uh, have a great day. Um, and I'll, I'll talk to you again soon. Be safe. You too, Coach.